This week's episode is brought to you by Kurt, Stevo, and Melinda, this week's newest patrons. A lot of you guys seem to be shopping right now, and you're asking me on Discord and on Facebook and Instagram, Tim, what do I buy? I need help. There's so much selection and so many opinions, obviously. The problem is that I can't tell you what to buy. I can only tell you what I'd buy because I'm kind of shopping too. Now, I can do all the research and I can give you my opinion, but ultimately the question is, what do you actually want? And maybe we'll luck out here. Maybe you'll want the same thing that I do. I want something that is small enough, um, small enough to single hand if I need to, uh, but not so big that it's dangerous when I try to dock it if I'm short staffed. And something that's easy to get on and off of from the dinghy, preferably a walk through transom with a sugar scoop. I'd like also the simplicity of a sloop rig. Now, I can live with the Hunter BNR rig if I have to, but I'd kind of like to not have to. I'd also need some dinghy davits to haul the rib around, um, or the option for dinghy davits, and somewhere to put a bunch of solar panels. I don't want to be worried about electricity while I'm out there in paradise. Um, I want minimal through hulls, if I can have that, and I want a draft of less than six feet, but I want it on a keel that will still sail upwind better than a U-Haul truck. So sorry to all the full keel boat guys out there. This one might not be for you. Inside the boat, I'm going to need at least one big stateroom that I'm going to live in um, with a reasonably sized galley and a reasonably sized head. And I'm going to need somewhere to do my work at. I need to put my laptop down somewhere comfortable to be able to make YouTube videos, obviously. Then I'd like some sort of a second stateroom for guests. And a second head is sort of a nice to have, but it's not a deal breaker. This episode then isn't about all the boats on the market in some given price point. We'll do the $120,000 episode next week. This episode is what I would personally buy for about the same price point. My opinion to meet my needs, and if your needs are the same, let me know. Um, Or if you just want to disagree, fight me in the comments. This week on everything you need to know, the sailboat I would buy personally for less than 120 grand. A little disclaimer, a few people always ask why I didn't cover this boat or that boat in these episodes at different price points, and everyone has a favorite that I didn't mention, and it's usually the boat that they own right now, and the truth of the matter is, I cover what's actually for sale when I do these price point episodes. I often get, whoa, 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 at that price point, why didn't you talk about the Hinkley so-and-so or the Halberg Razzie whatever? If there aren't any for sale at the given price, I just can't cover them. So I start my search today and immediately something interesting comes up, something I have to talk about. It's no secret that I currently live just off the Great Lakes, off Lake St. Clair, on the Canadian side very near to Windsor, Detroit. And I've been hearing rumors all summer, for the last six months at least, about some crazy big sailboat that's just sitting in a crop field somewhere around here um, in the vast farmland that is this place. Now, I never imagined it would be much more than maybe an old catch that came up from Lake Erie because anything bigger than about 45 feet really has no business being around here. Um, And it turned up for sale, honestly, just around the corner from my house. This, my friends, is the somewhat controversial McGregor 65. Honestly, this thing just popped up as soon as I started searching. Some say it's the boat that ruined McGregor. And yes, when we say McGregor, I do mean the trailer, sailor, slash powerboats that you either love or hate. Mostly, I suspect, hate. And for whatever reason, McGregor set out to build, from their trailer, sailor days, a very large, heavy displacement yacht aimed at the luxury market. And this is what they came up with. And honestly, it's kind of beautiful. This is the pilot house version and honestly I'd love to hear the story on exactly why this showed up in a crop field in Merlin, Ontario. Now I bring up this boat just because it's interesting and happens to be where I live though I've never actually personally seen it I just know it's around here somewhere. Uh, Would I buy it to go cruising? Well, uh, it would be really cool. It's a cool boat and it's extremely fast. It's known as one of the fastest cruising boats ever made. Um, It would also be a great project because the inside's sort of barren and I could set it up the way I want to to check all of my other boxes. But alas, not for the $110,000 US asking price. Honestly, I'd be interested in it for maybe 
25,000. I know that's maybe mean, uh, but not much more. With the option, I'd want to work on it in said crop field um, because once you lift this thing up and put it in, that's it. You have to sail it south. There's nowhere around here to keep this boat and nowhere to haul it out once it's in. Anyway, that's an interesting boat. Moving on to boats I'd actually entertain right away. We have this handsome Hunter H38. And I know we love to hate on Hunter, but follow me for a second on this one. She's already in Florida, so, you know, it's not a crop field in Merlin. Um, and she's ready to buy. She already has solar panels. I mean, they're cute. Um, and dinghy davits, so it's less stuff to deal with when you buy it. I like the black hull and the Dodger and the Bimini arrangement. And it's a shallow keel. Um, that Hunter is fairly fast with. This hull is actually a really quick hull, and I suspect that that's the keel from the Legend series of boats in the 375, so I happen to know it will point very well. Um, though, I'm not a huge fan of the rudder being unprotected. Now, I get my sugar scoop, I get my walkthrough out back, um, and that makes the boat easier to live with, and I get a full suite of instruments, even though that's not what really sells me a boat anyway. I get a very rock-solid Yanmar, which I like, especially compared to the Volvo that I have now. There's nothing wrong with the Volvo, just Yanmar is much more common, therefore more support and more easy access to parts. The Hunter 38, it's the living space that blows me away on this boat. Look at this thing. I get an absolutely huge saloon with room to really live and be comfortable on the day-to-day -day while I cruise on this boat. And that matters to me so much more than not having a backstay because, of course, this is a BNR rigged boat. I get a great looking nav desk to do work at so I can afford to keep cruising in paradise and I get a full suite of radios and electronics inside at the nav station within reach. And This is the model with two staterooms and the aft cabin is monstrous. Monstrous compared to any other boat even five feet bigger and it has its own private access to the head. The galley is also huge and look at the counter space in this boat. The companionway stairs are large and easy to use and there are tons and tons of port lights and hatches to make it more comfortable inside. Then we have a reasonable V-berth for the guests to sleep in. I honestly set out on this episode without knowing what I'd find, and I made a list of the stuff that I needed in a boat um, before I actually looked at any boats. And this boat literally checks everything from the aft cabin to the desk, the V-berth, the layout. It's got davits, it's got solar. The thing I'm not super thrilled about is of course that BNR rig, which is harder to step and unstep as a DIY, and it has no backstay, so I lose some of the ability to play with the rig while I'm racing, but I think every boat is a compromise. And they're asking 119,000 US, which I think is fair for what this is. I wish it was a bit cheaper, but it'll likely sell at this price point eventually. But don't think this is the only option. There are six or seven Hunter 38s on sale right now. Next up, we have another promising candidate, and there are about 10 of these for sale, so, I mean, take your pick. This one is the two-cabin layout, which is what I want, and it's in really good shape. Sitting in Rhode Island, it's an Oceanus Clipper 393. This one, of course, is the one I picked to look at because it already has davits for the dinghy, and it has some more cute-looking solar panels on top, so it's less to do once you buy it. It also has a Rockna already on the bow, though I suspect I'd bring my own if I bought this boat because that looks like the Rockna 33 or 35. Mine's the 55, and I mean, you can't be too careful. We get a large cockpit with some comfy looking chairs, get a good spray hood and a bimini for protection and comfort, and it looks like all the lines are led aft, which for me is a point of contention that I want to bring up. People use the all lines led aft as sort of a sales pitch, and I find that kind of silly. I mean, you can lead all the lines aft on any boat, and it's fairly easy to do. And sometimes, some lines shouldn't be led aft. For example, I, a boat I recently helped someone buy had the jib halyard led aft. Why? It's a furling. Why would you ever need access to the jib halyard? This boat gets the high aspect fin, but only drawing 5 feet, so it's a reasonable depth but still being able to point fairly high. And being a Beneteau, you also get the near plumb bow and almost a full length waterline, so it won't be slow under power when it's standing straight up. Again though, unprotected rudder blade, which kind of irks me. We do get some interesting sails with this clipper as well. Some are red, some are black. I'm not sure why they did this or how I feel about it. 
Does it matter? I suspect not. It's probably going to be even prettier and people will know which boat is yours. We also get the sugar scoop and the walkthrough that we need. This boat also sports tons of hatches and port lights to let the air and light inside, which is huge. If you've ever lived on an 80s racer cruiser in what we like to call the cave, it's not fun. Seriously, I'd be happy to never see Teak inside a boat again for the rest of my life. Inside the Benny, it isn't as big as the Hunter, but the craftsmanship looks really good and there's lots of space to starboard to get work done and lots of storage on that side of the boat. This model gives us an aft head and a really big aft cabin, which is likely where I would call home, opposite a good sized galley. It's big enough to keep me happy. Up front on this bottle, we get the Pullman style forward berth, which some people like and some people don't. The advantage to the Pullman though, is you get a huge head with a huge shower up in the V-berth, which seems nice. But in that Pullman berth, if two people are in it, kind of makes it hard for one of those people to get in and out of. This boat gives us a good looking electrical system and the Yanmar that we like. And everything looks very clean and well taken care of. I don't think a lot of things are gonna show up on this survey. It's important to note that these 393s can be had for about 10 or 20 grand less than that Hunter 38 that we looked at previously. And I think it boils down to the Hunter is just bigger inside. Is it 10 or 20 grand bigger? I'd like to go find out. Honestly, with this layout and this amount of space, I think this would be my top pick boat for my single dude adventure kind of thing or single chick adventure. Um, I'd stay in the aft cabin and whomever was there to help crew could have the Pullman up front with the big head. Um, two sort of private areas of the boat and lots of space in the middle to entertain guests. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. Honestly, I couldn't do it without you guys. If you want to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron. Another quick side note. Um, the reason my videos are all off schedule this month, uh, I'm really sorry about that, but I had a computer part break. Um, and for the computer people uh, who might know what this is, it's a triple 120 ROG liquid cooler for my 5950X. So you might know how much this costs and why it's so frustrating to me. Anyway, I had to wait on a replacement. It took a week, uh, but the computer's back up. So that's why the schedule went weird. Next up is an older and much larger boat, but I would genuinely entertain this as an option to be my Delos. And what I mean by that is sort of like my party boat. Um, this one, if I bought it, I'd turn this YouTube channel into a traveling group of people sort of thing, very Delos-like. Uh, maybe two couples and a rotating number of guests while we cruise the world. This then is a boat I've had my eye on for years. I really like this thing. This is a 2001 Beneteau 50. And this one is interesting because it used to be a four cabin charter layout and it was converted for private use, uh, making the forward two cabins into one. This is the model that even has crew quarters through a hatch in the deck. It doesn't look very comfortable. I'd likely convert this space into storage for the water toys, the paddle boards, things like that. This boat gives us everything on the checklist, but it also gives us a lot more. Everything about this boat is ridiculous. From 132 gallons or 500 liters of diesel, insane, to the staggering 264 gallons or a thousand liters of fresh water. And this is the shoal version too, so we can still take it to the Bahamas, it's just shy of six feet of keel, and a hull that will happily shred anything that tries to race it short of a catamaran, but it'll outpoint the catamaran, so I'm not going to complain. The interior of this boat is massive on every scale, and that's what I think really sells me on this. I can live on it, have almost endless amounts of space, and the option to make sure I'm comfortable with crew aboard, and they'll be as comfortable as I am. And I won't feel like I'm sacrificing anything or I'm stuffed into a little fiberglass tube. This is more of a nice, spacious apartment. Now I know that this boat is probably too much boat for some people, and yes, it will need about 50 grand worth of work right out of the gate, most likely. And yes, there's way more to go wrong and a higher cost of ownership, but that's the kind of person that I am. I love the DIY of it all. I don't mind working on the boat endlessly to improve it. And I see this boat as it wouldn't just be me. Um, you can have a good cruising buddy join you and go see the world. It really is a Delos type of deal here. 
obviously this boat needs a few things right out of the gate to sort of suit my needs. I'd immediately like to get that dinghy off the deck and put some huge davits on the back with at least 1500 watts of solar, probably more, and a pair of wind turbines. Um, and let's get the electricity sorted out right away, right? We don't want to have to worry about electricity. And for that amount of diesel, it had better have a polishing system and some sort of system to take care of all that fresh water that you're running around with. Filtration is a must, and largely because this boat is rigged right from the factory, so the side decks can be drained um, by choice um, right into the water tank. So you really never run out of water as long as it rains every once in a while. For a $109,000 asking price, I'd fly into St. Lucia where this boat is and I would give it a go for sure. Probably head from there up to the Bahamas based on the season right now, resupply in Florida, and then take it to wherever my little heart desires picking up crew along the way. This boat would have to be called Lady K2, but I wouldn't be mad if it was just called Adventure. Okay, but back into the reality of boats I can actually handle without a crew. Um, this is one of my top picks for a single couple to head south, maybe retired couple, with room for guests when the need arises. Uh, and this list wouldn't be complete without a Catalina. This then is the 380. This is the 1997 Boat of the Year winner, and at only 38 feet, you might at first wonder why all 10 of them I found go on sale for 100 grand, up to 120 grand. It's only a 38 footer but it's because they are just fantastic boats, and they're much bigger inside than the waterline might make you guess. And we, of course, get the things we're looking for here. We get a walk-through transom on sort of a sugar scoop. We get a big, roomy cockpit to lounge around in on the sunny days, but also lots of port lights and hatches to make the inside more livable. I love the layout, too. What really sells me on this boat has to be the aft cabin. Now you get access to the cabin on both sides of the boat, which is sort of unique. One way is through the head, and the other way is directly through the galley, which I think is really cool. The main saloon is huge and looks very livable on the day-to-day, -day, and the V-berth gets its own little sink and small countertop. The galley is a good size, and when you walk into the aft cabin, you really see why single couples love this boat so much. It's basically a master stateroom with ensuite head, and this is just by every measure an exceptionally good layout. This boat is everything I could ask for in a Caribbean cruiser without being too much. It's not oversized or unwieldy in a marina. It's also not overpriced, and it's new enough that you can still get insurance on it, as well as parts uh, when things inevit inevitably break down. It's also a shoal keel, and many of them are already outfitted with davits and solar arrangements, life rafts, and e -perbs, because many of them have already been out there cruising. Now, it may be nothing special. It's just sort of a boat, but it'll do the job and it'll do it very well. There are of course some things about this boat that I'm not a huge fan of. If I had to have a boat I'm going to fall in love with and I want to take pictures of it, this isn't it. I don't find it to be particularly pretty. It's just a plastic boat that offers me everything I asked for. No more, no less. I can't be mad at it. Now, it is a Catalina, so I'm sure it sails very nicely, but it's missing that X factor, something that makes it special. The Hunter we looked at, for example, was ridiculously roomy. The Clipper we looked at would likely outsail this Catalina. The Benny 50 is just an adventure-seeking monster. So what is this thing, then? It's just a boat that's well-made, very capable, and very comfortable. Maybe if you put a furling code sail on the front, I'd find it more interesting. That's it for this week, guys. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up to feed the algorithm. If you want to see more, please hit that subscribe button. Until next week, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. You gotta heal it. You gotta heal. See you guys.